All right, so it's recording on. Welcome to the Devil Podcast, tell to you by Fly the Lyo. Please tune in to hear what we are up to in developer relations for the coming week. Learn about our latest product updates, also known as fresh produce, and discover the issues our users face and how we have helped them overcome those challenges. And today's episode is a little bit special because we have a special guest, Senyo, from our, from our platform engineering team. Welcome to the show. How are thank you, you thank Senyo? you. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, life's not too hectic at the moment. It's actually election day in South Africa, so it's a pretty, pretty big day in the country. So, yeah, but yeah. otherwise, otherwise good, yeah. Shall we expect some turbulences because of the, like people uh, outside the windows or something? No, <laughs> nah, it's all good. It's all good. I'm in a very quiet area of the, of the city, so no problems. Okay, that's great. So let's quickly discuss what we are up to uh, this week, maybe in the past weeks, what are our plans, experiments. So, Sarah, since you were transporting maybe you can give us an update on what you're working on on the platform team cool so yeah at the moment it, there's kind of like two things running concurrently i would put it that way so there's a kubernetes works for like kubernetes that right now we're working on introducing what kubernetes calls sidecars i'm not working on that specifically um but there's work going on there so i'm just monitoring that and then when that's ready, you can integrate it into Flight Kubernetes. And then the other thing that I'm mainly working on is basically uh, sort of like user-facing metrics for our some of our platform components, mainly the proxy, um, so that users can be able to see that, like, you know, is the proxy working correctly? And if they're ever having issues or want to just observe uh, or answer some questions about the performance of their systems, they can understand like how much like overhead the proxy adds, for instance, um, or if there's any issues with it at a certain point in time and how that affects them. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. it at the moment. Mm -hmm. So in our devil world, it's about a bunch of meetups. So when it comes to my work, uh, last week I basically attended two meetups, one was fat on JavaScript and the other one was so on eBPF stuff, so low level Linux thingy. And I have a few in the pipeline, uh, actually the next week, the Elixir one, on um, which I'm giving the talk on Elixir clustering, a fact that I own, and then, uh, in two weeks or so chairs on, on Tickeries and a few other bits. In between, I'm trying to, to work on talks around next chairs mainly and, uh, some um, AI examples. In particular, I want to deploy a Polish HoloLand on our infra. Uh, Tanafos, any interesting on your side? It's all interesting all the time. Uh, no, I've uh, attended two, well, one meetup and one kind of small conference. Uh, and like one was with the Linux user group of ETF, uh, which was a, a, a bit intense. I felt very stupid. Like, yeah, you know, people That's cracking funny. Linux jokes, everyone laughing, and me not understanding a single word. Nah, nah. <laughs> What's the EBPF? No, no, that actually happened at a meetup. Uh, since then, like I, uh, the meetup that I attended, uh, I spoke to a couple of folks who also actually were quite interested in trying out Flyo, and one of them was actually very specifically interested in Kubernetes. Then, uh, and we'll wait for mm -hmm. that. So we'll segue back into that. So you later. Uh, and other than that, I've just been jamming my agenda with events. Uh, so next week I'm going to DrangoCon, and we have like two events in the Netherlands. Uh, and in between that, I have some meetups. And also, I'm going for a run up with the JIO people, which is going to be. Oh, yeah. sounds nice. Do you travel by car or the public transportation is big enough to get to all of those meetings? So, in the Netherlands, public transport is great. So, I just do everything by public transport and uh, skateboard. And then, you know, the JIO combo. That's great. Cool. That, that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, the, the roads are good for bikes here, right? So they're also good yeah, for Yeah, that's true. Yeah, oh, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, Jared guy is in, in Spain, actually. So that's going oh, to cool. involve some flying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Roman, what have you been to, Roman? I guess the bulk of my time lately is spent on hiring, actually. We're making some changes to like the Debra hiring side of things. Uh, 
so that's you know we'll, we'll be changing the the process maybe a little more uh to have folks present a little earlier on so we're kind of trying to figure that out uh yeah it's quite exciting and we're, we're hiring a field marker as well which will help well, us at done specifically like to run events with the logistics and figuring out ways to show up and yeah nice. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm going to try this weekend. I'm wondering if I should, you know, bring some stickers and uh, crash a meetup somewhere. So <laughs> that <laughs> might happen. Can we have yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Who are you going yeah, to I'm not going to a specific event. I'm just, to, I'm just going there. Ah, oh, nice. Anyhow, I, would go. I, I might meet some folks I know there and casually bring them. Mm-hmm. It's not good. <laughs> I mean, for sure, don't don't be doing work outside of work hours, right? Oh, yeah. It's just enjoy yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's it. Just put the stickers on the place to see yeah. I think yeah, although, a little, <laughs> bit of, little bit of street art here and there. Yeah, well, you can, you, like... we can we can be like the company version of Banksy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't have the artistic chops. Yeah, yeah that's so, you know, yeah, and he's art's pretty red, so you know, if I if yeah, I want to have stickers, I should be good. All right, folks, that was a great update. Um, so let's quickly discuss what's been happening to Flyio through fresh producers. I can see there have been a bunch of them, so probably we won't have time to cover everything. But if you're interested, you can go to our forum and check out the fresh producers probably. But let's have a look at some of the interesting ones here. Yeah. And to look back here, Flight Traffic in your yeah. choice of formats yeah th- does anybody know like promise of this change like was there a lot of uh desire for json as a configuration format i i think there's been a lot of chatter around like templating around fly uh, fly domo and one thing led to another i i i guess let me i might be projecting but that's my impression of it. And then, right. you know, we've had a piece written as a proof of concept, which allowed to, uh, to source other kinds of files, mm-hmm. which yeah. is an easy yeah. way, I guess. Not everybody yeah. likes to use Toml, unless that's... you're, you know, coming from Python background, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, folks might be used to JSON more or, you know, and folks who like to write the animals for a living, they, you know, the, the preference I guess that's you, Sanyo. <laughs> yeah, it was not me. And as far as YAML. But yeah, in Kubernetes, that's basically everything. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. yeah good the exact day. There's also, I mean, it's it might have happened overnight, but we published an update on a new uh, way to health check your apps with, with machine health checks. That seems pretty interesting. The, the other one I found myself interesting is on the fixed uh, MySQL support for Phoenix and Acta, since uh, basically it wasn't working on the Flyio infrastructure because we were not able to, from a Phoenix app using Acta, we were not able to connect to uh, MySQL instance uh, with. Uh, uh, and it is it, and the issue was simply in the actual library because it was not correctly accepting the option because by default it will use IPv4. And the defect abuse post itself contains an interesting story and links how we fixed that. The, the, the bug was very simple. We tried to merge, uh, I mean, the library will try to merge uh, keyword list and, and the list, which didn't basically work and be fix that for the community. That's oh, pretty cool. Did some great open source work is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, that was open source work. Just a few lines of code, but still important ones. Nice. And also like the, the fresh produce based uh, from the, the transparency of the email support. I mean, yeah, I think uh, it fits well with what we're doing in terms of transparency of the company. So like, uh, it's, it's nice to see that we are continuing that line. Yeah, I was yeah. also thinking it could be actually a motivation for the support team and uh, just for themselves, themselves, but they, they want the metric to be as good as possible. 
So it's that uh, also a self motivating thing for them. And at least if I were all about email, I it would like do a post graphics to a great basically. Yeah, it's kind of like part of the team as well. I'm part of the community as well. And yeah. see what the expectation is in regards to support, which is pretty cool. I think like a bunch of teams at Flyout are shipping these kind of like transparency related metrics to the community, which I claim to uh, say I was mentioning a bit earlier on, uh, for the, for the, for the flight proxy bit as well. The, how this one a specific threat could be specific in the sense that to they understand it, it doesn't introduce anything new, just, uh, tries to highlight that the machines have, uh, they don't have static IPv6. So they could change over the machine lifetime, especially when the machine migrates. And I, I, uh, it just kind of resonates with me because recently for the EDP meetup, I was kind of uh, getting myself a little bit more familiar with, uh, private networking and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, once you understand how we, uh, map different IDs on type IPv6 address, like there's a, a host ID in it, machine ID in it, network ID in it. So you can imagine that in those, uh, environment, this environment changes, but the host ID meaning that machine migrates between hosts, then the IP changes. So that's also quite interesting. I, I think, um, that reminds me of, uh, of, uh, one work item I would like to pick up is to refine networking docs to make them, to make the networking part easier to understand so that you can easily mass as opposed to the other networking setup. Okay, I, I see the list and I think we've covered quite a few of the first producers. Uh, do you want to cover anything else? So, okay, so we are ready to jump to the actual topic of our meeting, uh, which is <laughs> like your method, but basically gonna pass. Don't want, don't want me to do that. No, 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 no. let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So we have Sandy with us, who is the author of, uh, Fly to Vernetis, and I can only imagine how complex that must have been to actually get it up and running. And I know that the John Matters has some super cool questions about that specific topic. So let's start it. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, I guess the first question is there, there is some, uh, well, let's call it a feeling that, you know, fly. I was a bit anti Kubernetes, and yet you yeah. have Kubernetes. Like, uh, <laughs> how, how did that decision come to be? Like, what did you end up learning a Kubernetes solution? Yeah. So, yeah, fly, at least again, from similar kind of like um, energy you get is pretty anti Kubernetes. More so just because, or at least from my opinion, Kubernetes does get extremely complicated, and fly, being fly, simplifies a lot of that infrastructure headache for you. So <clears throat> yeah, Kubernetes is not the flavor of the day. Um, but the reason that we, we built this and we have a couple of customers that already use Kubernetes and would like to, uh, run on fly.io and basically don't want to have to sort of like port their whole Kubernetes deployments into like fly land. So they don't want to have to learn the APIs specifically that Fly uses just to uh, move over the applications. So um, we built it just to make that sort of like portability easier. So if companies already have big Kubernetes deployments or are very experienced with Kubernetes already and want to run on our platform, they can just drive the platform with the Kubernetes API and get out like <clears throat> exactly um, it's all very similar deployments that they already have. So there's kind of like a less friction for those set of customers essentially when right. coming to us. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And like, uh, do you have a bit more of an idea? Like, uh, you know, like Kubernetes being complex is like one reason why Fire is and well, has well, yeah, anti Kubernetes yeah. energy, but like is there more to it or is it really just the complexity question? I, well, I can't say I'll speak for everyone, but I, I actually don't think that there's much more to it than that. It's also that like there's some level of oh, what you could call it scope creep in Kubernetes where there's like an ever growing, like if you look at the landscape, that CNCF landscape board, I mean, there's yeah. like a crazy number of 
different things you can do to your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, yeah, and I mean, like, it's all necessary. I'm, I'm not one of those people that thinks like Kubernetes is too complicated. In a way, I think that a lot of the complexity is warranted and you'll need it at maybe some level of flexibility. It's just that a lot of companies don't need that amount of flexibility, I would say. And so, yeah, there's a lot of scope even there's just a lot of flexibility and you can kind of do anything with Kubernetes. And so that, uh, I guess causes a lot of headaches. Like you have to be extremely disciplined. If, right. if you have that amount of flexibility and so uh, deployments become very complicated, they become difficult to upgrade, maintain, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, it's very much against like the flood of IO ethos. If okay. Being and so, so, yeah. And so in, in, in your opinion, like, let's say you, you're started kind of fresh and, you know, like you're kind of realizing your app is needing a bit more oomph to it like uh do you think you can achieve the same things that you achieve with kubernetes like just with fly io like just utilizing the machines api right so i think there's mostly yes i haven't personally run like super uh complicated kubernetes deployments um myself so i won't say that you know for the super complicated very large scale deployments I don't know exactly what kind of like custom tweaks they have there, but for the most part, yeah, I would say absolutely. You can run most things that you want to do on Kubernetes on fly using our API. I mean, in the way that we, we implemented fly Kubernetes, which we'll get to later, it basically just uses our platform. So there's, there's no magic source there right. really. Yeah. So, so to, to that point, like how different is the fly Kubernetes solution to well, something like ETS or whatever. Other yeah. Platform. So I would say that the sort of like biggest difference is that uh, the flat Kubernetes <laughs> solution isn't, isn't extremely general purpose. Like there are some, it, it's, it's got boundaries. Let's put it that way. You get like a certain box and you can only do things within those constraints. And so whereas a lot of the, like your EKS more so and GKE as well Google Kubernetes engine, they're fairly general purpose. So you can sort of like run any kind of Kubernetes deployment on them and install any sort of like drivers or, or sidecars or any, any kind of flavor of the day that you want. Whereas ours are kind of like opinionated. You can only deploy volumes in a certain way and there's no, we don't have nodes in, in a, in a way. So you don't have to like go around configuring those, but if you wanted like some level of customability with the, the sort of like hosts that your Kubernetes pods run on, like we don't expose that at the moment. So <clears throat> we're more of like a, I would say the developer experience is a lot nicer, but right. it is somewhat restricted if I can put it that way. So I don't think I, that's I... in practice an issue, but yeah. Yeah, like, is it fair to say that, like, because of these boundaries, like, you're able to offer a better developer experience? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Right, right. Shimon is having yeah. a question, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I have a question, because I can imagine that since we have this, this boundaries and the limitations compared to other, or just general, uh, for this general that is offered by other providers, I can imagine yeah. there is a challenge in advertising them or just being clear about the new dogs and you know making people aware mm. of how it's different and what they cannot do in in the way that doesn't you know prevent them from trying really so is there yes. a strategy to to for for that issue how do um, you that? yeah i don't know if there's a strategy around it i think a lot of it just has to be having a lot of clarity on where the differences would come in because I guess a lot of people will come into the platform with certain expectations, and I don't even, exactly. I don't even, I don't even think that they would be like, they wouldn't be met. It's, it's just, just like, okay, I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to worry about that. Or I don't have to worry about this, but then they may have other, uh, questions like they want to run specific types of things and we take care of those, but they're used to, maybe they run like a, a, a mesh, like a service mesh and I, I, I think you can run one on us. I'm not hundred percent sure. I haven't tried personally, but we kind of like have our own networking, uh, between pods all set up for you 
when you create a cluster. And so if they, if a customer is like really obsessed with doing it a certain way, um, we have to kind of be clear about those expectations and like how you can, um, potentially not get what you want out of it or break the certain applications in a certain way. Um, or they won't work as expected. Let's put it that way, given some of the constraints that we have. So I think it's more about just being very clear about like what we do and don't support and how that interacts with like deployments that you might have already. And so do, do we have any customers that have like migrated their Kubernetes infrastructure onto fly? So not at the moment in the sense that there's a, there's a big feature that we've still got to get out, which is sidecars and a lot of customers that we've spoken to use sidecars. It's a very, it's a very common feature in Kubernetes. And so a lot of deployments have them because you will run like your main application and then like a log shipper as a sidecar or a service mesh. They also run as sidecars, a lot of them, um, and any other kind of like applications there. So there's a lot of people basically waiting for that feature to land. Fair right. right. Well, I think one interesting thing to, to kind of maybe dive a bit deeper into is you mentioned, you know, like we have these bounties and like it's very much focused towards having this, this nicer developer experience. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about like the, the things that you did to make this uh, developer experience, uh, yeah, as nice as possible. It was, yeah. So, um, I think starting from one interesting thing that came out when we launched or like when we started speaking about that we're doing Fly Kubernetes is that uh, some people fairly early on tacked onto the fact that it's like nodeless Kubernetes. So basically you don't manage any of the, the nodes, which are like the hosts that you run on. You don't have to worry about capacity or anything. <clears throat> we basically, we just deploy your parts as Fly machines for you. And uh, that was like one of the bigger talking points out of, out of that discussion. So I think it's like one of those features, um, which really helps the developer experience because people say that like managing capacity of nodes can get pretty, uh, difficult and like, like capacity and utilization, let's say. And so with us, because we can deploy across our fleet or in a certain region, yeah. that's taking, that's taking care, care of for you. So you, you don't even have to worry about that problem at all. A lot of the, like, uh, yeah. Before, before we continue, like, uh, what are like the, the traditional or more common problems that you would normally run into when, when trying to manage your own nodes? Uh, it's mainly, I think it's, it would be, it would be mainly managing capacity. So if you're running your own nodes and you need to, let's say, deploy a whole lot extra pods, you know, your, your, you'd have to manage the capacity of your underlying host or nodes essentially. Um, so there's capacity management that happens there. And then on top of that is utilization. And so you can have situations where maybe like your, your, the way that your application is structured, it's hard to get like a consistent 80% utilization out of your hosts, for instance. Um, even though you might need to scale up when hosts start reaching like 50, 60, 70%, um, due to the nature of your application any other kind of constraint. So I think mean, it's, it's mainly, it's mainly that it's, it's mainly your yeah. capacity planning and maybe utilizing your nodes as much as possible, which can be, can be difficult. Right. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's, that's one, uh, I think really big plus uh, some of the others, um, all of your, your, you so your cluster is created in a virtual private network. So you don't have to worry about like how nodes get connected to each other and worry about like all the networking semantics, like what, um, IP ranges are going to allocate to nodes and to pods and all that kind of stuff. It's all handled for you on the get go. Then there's a client authentication. So if you're using like a uh, cube control or cube cuddle or how any, however anybody says those, uh, that command is, um, we, we handle that for you. So we have like a, it's called an exec plugin. So, uh, when you, we, when you create a cluster, we give you a cube config and that cube config is basically configured to call, uh, fly control to generate tokens for you to refresh at some, at some rate. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about like figuring out how to get your 
gets your clients authenticated to the cluster as well. One other nice perk there is that you connect to your cluster via WireGuard, so it's always secure, which is a big plus. Um, so your cluster is never exposed over the internet, it's in public internet. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I'm wondering if the networking is any different uh, from the private, so you have a private network within your app or organization. Uh, it's the same, it's all the underlying, it's the same uh, stuff that's mm -hmm. on like standard fly applications, I, I guess. In, in, in reality, what happens is when you create a cluster, each namespace is a fly app in any case. So the whole, the whole uh, implementation of fly Kubernetes basically uses the platform primitives that we have. So if you know how mm -hmm. to use fly.io, the platform, basically just doing that through a Kubernetes interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That brings me to another interesting question. If you can, if you have an inverse view, like your Kubernetes setup, if you know, this is real with the app that the Kubernetes cluster uses, but you somehow prevent that. Yeah. At, no, at the moment, there's no real, so you could, for instance, like create a whole lot of resources through Kubernetes and delete them through flight control like this. No, exactly. Yeah. So you could really destroy your Kubernetes clusters if you use mm -hmm. both deployment options, basically. And your Kubernetes, I mean, in, in essence, though, like Kubernetes is about driving your deployments to the correct state. So in theory, it should still spin up as uh, more of the, like, if you delete your pods, your Kubernetes cluster or controller will spin up new pods. Um, but still, you, you never know, like you, you could do a whole lot of things, migrate your, your, your applications to a different organization, which will, which will, uh, uh, with your cluster, you could delete volumes underneath Kubernetes out of knowing that will also screw the cluster. So like, yeah, the, there are. In 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 theory, you should do one or the other, basically. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's just probably like a theoretical to what you run with, but I, I can imagine that some advanced users could actually take advantage of this fact that the Kubernetes cluster is just that and knowing the platform do certain things. Like if there's something missing in the API, yeah, they, they could try kind of supplement that by, you know, doing something yeah. manually. And that's, yeah. that's not what you want, that's just an, <laughs> an option or by accident yeah. it happens to be that way. Yeah, it, it's a workaround. It will probably happen in future, to be honest. You know, there's that, there's mm -hmm. that law, I think it's called Hiram's Law or something that like any sort of, any sort of like, not explicit feature, but any way that your, your applications behave, they'll get used by somebody somehow. So the example they use is like, if you're, if you have an API request coming in and your API generally takes like five seconds to reply, even though there's no guarantee on that, people will start building the applications with the knowledge that this thing takes five seconds. And if that changes to 10 seconds or three seconds or whatever, you might break the applications. So mm -hmm. it's like weird things like that. So in my mind, I'm like, you know, the, the more people that start using it and the more familiar you get, somebody will probably try something like that at some point. I mean. In that sense, like, you know, it's also like good to know that underneath it, it's all just fly primitives. Yeah. And, like, if you need kind of this, you know, almost a plugin system that you can yes. build on top for, for your specific use cases, it's, it's nice to know that it's possible. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, like, uh, obviously we have to talk about AI, uh, how, how is <laughs> Kubernetes with GPUs? Unplugged? Yeah. So we Kubernetes or black Kubernetes does support GPUs. It, it's again. The same thing where we're basically driving uh, our platform through Kubernetes. So we have Fly GPUs as a product. Um, and essentially all Fly Kubernetes does is you specify you want a certain GPU and a certain number of uh, GPU cores, I guess. And yeah, it'll just deploy it for you in the same, in the same way. Like you don't really have to worry about any sort of, uh, <laughs> additional drivers or device plugins, a lot of the other um options you have to install certain device plugins to get them to work for your nodes to be able to run the gpus with kubernetes um but in our case again gpus are just fly machines so we, 
we just create them for you and they land on GPU hosts and they'll run for you. So it's really, it's really straight out of the box. In fact, like supporting it really took like a few hours of work. It, it was really simple <laughs> after having built a lot of the stuff that we had uh, before. So. I guess uh, maybe now also, since, since we're talking a lot about like, you know, like mapping like to the primitives of Fly.io, like, uh, like yes. uh, how, how did the implementation of FKS go like, you know, like I recently saw this talk in the, the next user group about mm -hmm. Kubernetes from scratch the hard way and yeah, 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 so. hard. Yeah. <laughs> like how from scratch was it? Um, so yeah, I mean, it was not as from scratch, well, in theory. So the way that it's built is. We have K3s, that's our Kubernetes uh, distribution that we're running. And then we have this thing called a virtual kubelet, which is really kind of like the magic trick of how the whole platform comes together. So virtual kubelet is like a kubelet implementation. So a kubelet runs on every node essentially, and is the thing that your Kubernetes API will communicate to, to deploy pods or create pods or delete them, whatever, whatever. So, uh, you, you, um, so we, so like, yeah, if you're creating a pod that you will make a request, I look at the API, the API will tell this kubelet on this node, like create this pod and then it will manage that for you. So, um, there's this virtual kubelet, which essentially acts like it's running on a node and registers itself with the API, but there's no node backing the kubelet essentially. It just acts like there is. And then when you, when requests go to that kubelet, you implement an API that's there in the virtual kubelet like spec and then can query or like create any sort of um, resources using a, a custom backend that you have. So in our case, what will happen is that the request, like let's say you want to create a pod, will go into the virtual kubelet. The virtual kubelet will then make a request to the machine's API and then that will create your fly machine essentially for you. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, you're asking how Scratch the implementation was. Yeah, so we have this translation there, which is like basically this virtual kubelet that shims resources over into fly machines um, and creates those resources for you. And then we have a bunch of like custom controllers to manage the life cycle of like different uh, resources. So let's say you create volumes, we use this... Um, what they call persistent volume claims. And you have to have a certain controller that watches claims and then figures out how to make resources, like make volumes for you, persistent volumes for you. And uh, so we have some uh, level of like custom implementations for certain parts of it. Our secrets as well, for instance, we store them as flyer secrets in what was Vault, but I think now is PitSim. And... Uh, so we've had I've got like custom controllers for watching those secret resources get created, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of um there's a lot of like work been done to sort of like map things into the fly world, but we don't have too much like you know, we didn't start, let's say, from scratch in a way and have to think a lot about Kubernetes itself. We just use K3s, which is really, really good. Right. And so, uh, I guess that if you're not fully familiar with like Kubernetes, like K3, is it, is it like a, a smaller implementation of what K3 is? Yeah. Yeah. So K3s is like a, it's a, it's an implementation of Kubernetes that runs as like a single binary. So everything is contained in like one binary, it's kind of like a lightweight yeah. Kubernetes mainly so that you can deploy it across like all kinds of, uh, compute. So you can run it, for instance, like in embedded systems a lot yeah. easier. I don't, I don't know if K8 itself, you can run on embedded systems as is, I don't, I'm not hundred percent sure, but like K3s for instance, it's a much better option for that. So yeah. All right. All right. And so like, uh, thinking about like what we have now, like, uh, well, what are the, the future plans to still implement or what would you like to see it? In the yeah. Offer? Yeah. So there are a few things like there's smaller, smaller things, like let's say like network policies, which allows you to specify what can talk to what, which, um, we have the platform feature, we just need to implement it in, in five Kubernetes. Um, but the big thing that I mentioned earlier is sidecars. That's like the big next feature that we've 
got to get out. It's just such a, a, a common feature in Kubernetes land. So that's the, the main thing. And there's yeah, works going on to getting that supported as a platform feature, and then mm -hmm. we'll roll that up into Kubernetes once that lands. So that's the main, uh, work left, I guess. Yeah. And so like, uh, what are the difficulties in implementing sidecars? Yeah. So the main difficulty is, so with machines, we run our own init process, which is the thing that like launches processes. And we built a lot of our stack assumes, including the init specifically, that there's only one image that you'll want to run. And, uh, so running multiple uh, images, so like multiple containers, let's say requires you, it requires you to be able to run like different Docker images, let's say, uh, so you want to mm -hmm. run like Nginx and Redis and then your application yeah. has three separate images. And we currently don't have all of the plumbing to support that specifically. And so, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the difficulties is just kind of like massaging our platform to support that functionality. See. Right. And so how, how are you working around the fact that we generally have just one image? Uh, the way that you can work around it right now is we support running multiple processes in an image. So you would mm -hmm. have to create an image that bundles like all of the things that you want to run in one, and then you can run those separately, but that is a little bit complicated and not the way you would think about using Kubernetes specifically. So it's not extremely, it's not like the, let's say the Kubernetes way of doing it, but it is possible if you, if you want to use flat Kubernetes today in that way. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like the, the common Kubernetes way of doing yeah. things. So it's a little bit, a bit too different for it to feel easy to use. And so, uh, while it is possible, I just, a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't reach for that option. So a lot of them are waiting for sidecars to land. Right. Right. And so when sidecars land, do you imagine it will be a lot easier to migrate into, into the fly offering? And do you yeah. think it will also be like, how, how easy will it be to like migrate out of fly? Like, yeah, so the, uh, I would say migrating into fly would be pretty easy. Um after that feature lands where the main thing is that you want to be able to support, like someone gives you the deployment and it just kind of like works out the box without too much fiddling with it specifically. And so, yeah, there's one or two things there, but Sarkoz is, is a big one and, uh, migrating out of fly. I think, I mean, at the end of the day, Kubernetes, a lot of people use it to avoid vendor lock-in. So it wouldn't be too much of a problem. The only thing that might trip up people at some point is that because we take care of a certain number of things, like you don't have to worry about thinking about like how your DNS is going to work or how to configure it yourself or how your networks work or like your community CNI and stuff like that, like it's all managed for you. So if you're moving across and the platform that you're going to pushes that complexity onto you or requires you to manually set it up it might be a little bit more frustrating, but at the end of the day, it's still, it's still Kubernetes. So yeah. I guess what you're saying is like, if you move away from fly, you're gonna have a worse experience than a fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the plan. That's the hope. <laughs> right. So, uh, actually one, 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 one more question to that point, like, let's say you, you know, for whatever reason, like to manage your own DNS and you, you like to figure all of this stuff out, like. Could you still do it on fly or are you in the wrong place? Uh, no, I would say, I would say no. And I, and I would say no mainly because it's not the way we would want people to run on us. Like we created the solution in a way, at least at the moment, you know, things can change, requirements can change, but at the moment we've created it to be used in a, in a certain way. So kind of like ejecting out of that box will also add a lot of operational burden on us. It's a managed product after all. So it's our Correct. problem to manage for you. And so the more kinds of ways you, I guess, push outside of those boundaries, it might break things, which will create a level of operational burden that we 
try to avoid by giving you a certain box. So right, yeah, right. we, we, I wouldn't suggest it. Let me put it that way. Um, but I was not close, just interested in, in how we deal with buildings on the same scene. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine retail is pretty good for two resources. You kind of configure yes. that, that, that would yeah. fit into the current scheme or we treat the Kubernetes clusters differently for some yeah. reason is why. Yeah. So we, the, the plan for billing is that you pay per cluster and then you, and then additionally pay for the resources that you use. Um, so you'll pay for us operating your Kubernetes cluster for you. And then you'd pay for like the underlying thing. So if you spin up 10 volumes and 15 machines, you'll pay the price for those specific resources themselves, essentially. Uh, awesome. yeah. So that's, that's the plan for billing. Uh, yeah, so I guess not, not too much different. It, the only, the only big change, I guess, is paying for the clusters. I think we're in one, one, one more thing. I, I was thinking if you were having fun building the, the whole thing, because I, I remember, yeah. I think it's, is in Rust to, uh, yeah, it... yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's mainly in Go actually. Ah, <laughs> okay. It's the yeah, proxy, yeah. which is Rust, right? Yeah. Flight proxy itself is Rust. Oh, okay. Yeah. I bet. Um, as for fun, I've had, I've had plenty of fun. I, I found it very ironic for myself because I had a plan in my mind that I would go my whole career without learning Kubernetes. I don't, I don't know why <laughs> I just, I decided at some point, like, I'm just not going to bother. And I think it's funny because I do, it's not even that like I ended up using it. I'm like creating the product that she's like, <laughs> you know, it's for Kubernetes. So, but. At the end of the day, I've had a lot of fun. I've, I've realized more so like why it's extremely useful and valuable to companies and, uh, mm-hmm. and also gain an appreciation f- for the technology itself and the, and the like level of flexibility it does give you. Um, and I went to KubeCon EU, which was cool. And just to see like the scale of how big this technology is was pretty crazy to me so like all in all like mm-hmm. yeah i just had like i've had like a, a, a lot of fun learning kubernetes i understand its value proposition and why it's useful and all those things more so now than obviously before and uh, yeah and generally it's been it's been a it's been a cool exercise uh building the, the product and like yeah there's been some parts that have been extremely difficult to get right and somewhat frustrating but i think that's the same with like all tech products so overall like as an as a as an engineer, it's been like a lot of fun. It's gonna probably feel like a dungeon, but I think we you mentioned Fly Proxy briefly. Yeah, and yeah. I'm wondering, can you still leverage Fly Replay and Fly Proxy when you're using FKS, or is it that when you choose to, you know, go to Kate's way, you're losing right. these cool features? Right. Uh, well, no. Well, you can still use them for sure. They they are available to you again because Fly Community is just fly platform driven through kubernetes so you can use them and in some ways like a lot of the so kubernetes has a system called like kubernetes services which basically is a way to um communicate with pods in using a um i want to say a construct that effectively has like a stable address or a stable name essentially so pods cycle in and out so if you try to con uh, communicate yeah, with pods yeah. directly, you know, <clears throat> that's not going to work so well, most likely. So you have services that front that, and that system, our services system is actually done or handled through fly proxy. So in theory, you're already using fly proxy when you <laughs> use yeah. fly Kubernetes. And then yeah, all the other features that the proxy have, like if you use fly replay in your, <clears throat> in your, in your machines or in your application, yeah, it will, it'll work as expected. Yeah, that's that's great. Cool. I think that, that this brings us to the end of the conversation. And actually today's episode, cool. and I think I, I know what will be one of the, I don't know, intros of our participants or however we're going to, um, you know, the, the episode, but I think that I made a plan not to work Kubernetes, but I happened to build it's first to actually, <laughs> <laughs> is that, is a really good service uh, yeah, for the whole thing. All oh, right. Good. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Senya. That was a awesome. great intro to actually deep dive into our Kubernetes and yeah. one of the offers, how it's built. I learned at home. Awesome. Thank you, Damapos. Thank you, Roman. 
Thanks for having me. Bye. Cheers. See you all.